My name is Adam Gordon, and I'm a senior campus advisor with Camera on Campus. I work with students across North America to combat the delegitimization of Israel on college campuses. Today's webinar comes at a time where college students are battling the fiercest anti-Israel and anti-Semitic activity we've ever witnessed. Camera's network of brave students with our extensive training and support face the unrelenting forces of anti-Jewish and anti-Israel propaganda every day. Each spring semester, anti-Israel detractors put what on what is known as Israeli Apartheid Week, where through mock apartheid walls, violent protests, and radical speakers, anti-Semitism spreads with impunity on university campuses. To combat this insidious campaign, Camera has launched a strategic initiative called Apartheid Week Exposed, a movement to empower pro-Israel students and give them tools to, to counter the narrative spread by anti-Israel propagandists. This year, we've launched our fourth iteration of this crucial initiative. In today's webinar, which is co-sponsored by our friends at the IAC, we will provide insights into Camera's proven strategies for confronting the apartheid libel and other lies head-on, as well as shed light on our campus efforts to support students in this challenging time. To unpack this, I'm joined by Sasha Chernyak, Content and Campaigns Manager at Camera on Campus, and Dr. Alex Safian, Associate Director and Research Director at Camera. I'll now turn it over to Dr. Alex Safian. Thanks very much, Adam. Um, what I'm going to talk about is where the demonization of Israel comes from and what can be done about it. Um, we have to understand where it comes from in order to really address what to do about it. What we see on college campuses today and in the media is uh, is not an accident. So it's crucial to understand how we got here, and that will tell us how to try to roll, roll it back. The charge that Israel is a racist apartheid state has a long history. From the mid-1950s, Soviet anti-Israel propaganda was making that case, usually attributed to writers with Jewish-sounding names. And while it didn't get much traction in the West at first, it did lay, lay the foundation within supposed non-aligned countries and taught the Arab states all, of, all the tropes of European anti-Semitism. What I'm going to do is just show you some of these, some of these uh, uh, pamphlets that were crucial in this effort. So here, sorry, let me just get the slideshow going. Sorry about that. You can see the first one. Zionism, a form of racism, always written, you can see at the top, I hope, I'm not sure if you can, let me try to minimize this, always written by somebody with a Jewish sounding name. Zionism, a form of racism. This is what they've been pushing, the Soviets had, were, for a very long time. And here's the second one, genocide Israeli style. So the charge of genocide is not anything new at all. It is something that, that has been going on for a very long time, and it's been building. To intensify their anti-Israel efforts even further, the Soviets created an official anti-Zionist committee of the Soviet public, led by Lieutenant General David Abramovich Dragunsky, a famous veteran who was twice honored as a hero of the Soviet Union, the highest award the country could offer. It's obvious from his name that he was Jewish. In 1975, two years, after active, two years after activation of the Arab oil weapon during the Yom Kippur War, the Soviet bloc, the Arab countries, and countries dependent on Arab oil passed the UN General Assembly Resolution 3379, branding Zionism as racism. As a UN ambassador, Daniel Patrick Moynihan memorably said while denouncing the resolution, a great evil has been loosed upon the world. The abomination of anti-Semitism, as this year's Nobel Peace Laureate Andrei Sakharov observed in Moscow just a few days ago, the abomination of anti-Semitism has been given the appearance of international sanction. The General Assembly today grants symbolic amnesty and more to the murderers of the six million European Jews. Moynihan was prescient, and while the resolution was repealed in 1991 during the Madrid process, it was effectively reinstated at the notorious World Conference on Racism 
in September 2001 held in Durban, South Africa. An alliance of anti-Israel nations and NGOs, chiefly Amnesty International and Human Rights Watch, launched a surprise attack on Jewish attendees in the Israeli delegation, jump-starting the boycott, divestment, and sanctions movement. The BDS campaign aims to convince the world that Israel is an apartheid state and therefore has no right to exist and should be dismantled using the same weapons marshaled against apartheid South Africa. The growing anti-Israel movement we have witnessed since Durban, and especially in the last few years, is a toxic brew of at least three related intellectual currents. Number one, Frantz Fanon's The Wretched of the Earth, a book not only justifying but sanctifying unlimited violence against alleged settler colonialists. Fanon, a psychiatrist, asserted that for victims of colonialism, inflicting extreme violence was therapeutic and therefore necessary. And note that settler colonialism is the epithet du jour now being widely used against Israel, especially for justifying the horrific murders of October 7th. We've heard this again and again. Number two is Edward Said's Orientalism, portraying the Arabs and especially the Palestinians as the ultimate victims who never initiate, never have agency, and are always blameless. They are the victims of Western imperialism, but also of intellectual imperialism and condescension at the hands of the so-called Orientalists, the Western scholars of Islam in the Middle East, especially the legendary Bernard Lewis. Said's work helped birth the pseudo-academic field of post-colonial studies, which is all the rage at so many of our universities. And finally, and most importantly, woke ideology, especially intersectionality, which is, I believe, why the campuses and newsrooms filled with recent graduates have suddenly gotten so much worse. All this is not to say that the mob supporting Hamas on campus or in the streets of London and Manhattan have any knowledge of Fanon or Said. Surveys have shown that most of those who chant the river to the sea are totally ignorant and don't even know which river or what sea. But the leaders and initiators know which river and what sea and know that the slogan means dismantling Israel and ethnically cleansing Israeli Jews. And in this, they are guided by the ideas of Fanon and Said. Similarly, the professors to support the anti-Israel movement to give it intellectual legitimacy, like Bashar Dumani at Brown or Joseph Massad and Hamad Dabashi at Columbia, to name just three among many, celebrate and build on the supposed insights of Fanon and Said. The same applies to NGOs like Amnesty International and Human Rights Watch, but they're stealthy about it. They don't explicitly support violence, but they hire people who do. And they do their best to excuse and minimize Palestinian violence, while at the same time criminalizing any effective Israeli self-defense. It's not an accident that in the last two years, both have published major reports explicitly accusing Israel of apartheid against Palestinians and Israeli Arabs. If students exposed to anti-Israel professors need assurance that Israel is bad and illegitimate and should be dismantled, all they need do is look at the Amnesty and HRW reports. The same goes for young journalists. With a few professors like Mossad on campus and enough of the right students on campus with these anti-Israel beliefs, hostility against Jews and Israelis will take off like a fulminating disease. The reason for this is the third element, intersectionality, which is a conspiracy theory that presents the world as divided between the oppressors and the oppressed and maintains that, be, that behind the scenes oppressors, for example, the United States, Israel, the UK, big pharma, big oil, defense contracts, etc., work together to maintain their privilege and wealth, thereby further oppressing their victims. And because the oppressors work together, so must the oppressed. Among the oppressed, there is a hierarchy of victims, with the Palestinians having clawed their way to the top, thanks in part to the media, amnesty, and HRW, etc. There is no space here for Jews at all, except as allies of the oppressed, that is, Jews who testify to the perfidy of the Jews and of Israel, which is reminiscent, really, of the Inquisition. The NYU professor Jonathan Haidt had a nice way of putting this. He said that intersectionality is like NATO for social justice warriors. When one group within the intersectional pantheon is attacked, it's an attack on all and all must rally to the cause. Thus the letter on October 7th condemning Israel, signed by 34 Harvard student groups, even before Israel had counted its dead or cleared its territory of all the invading Hamas terrorists. 
the Palestinian and Arab students who put out the call and the fellow victim groups inter intersectional hierarchy responded as one. Thus, the massive demonstration in London on October 8th, the day after the attack. Did the vast majority of those people have any idea what they were protesting? No, but it didn't matter. To have an effective anti-Israel and anti-Jewish movement on campus requires what I called the right students. What I meant by that was intersectional Palestinian or Arab students who can present their, quote, lived experience as sufficient, sufficient proof of Israel's evil. It's actually worse than evil. It's cosmic evil, as Bernard Lewis put it, in describing the difference between anti-Semitism and other forms of prejudice. Cosmic evil, meaning no matter what Israel is accused of, it's believable. For example, just in the last week, Hamas spokesman charged that IDF snipers were shooting Palestinian children in the head and that Israel is stealing organs from dead Palestinians for transplant into Jews. The fact that such transplants are medically impossible made no difference at all. So that is what we face. In the media, on many elite campuses, in the influential so-called human rights groups, in some labor unions, and even in many town councils across the country. Hillary Clinton, who teaches at Columbia University School of International and Public Affairs, gave a very apt description of the situation in her speech to the Munich Security Conference last month. Here's some of what she said. What is so frustrating is that people have very little to no information about all the efforts that were made, literally starting in 1948, but certainly moving most dramatically to the year 2000 to actually create a state for the Palestinian people. I say that because even when I'm teaching with very smart students, and the students are from all over the world at the School of International and Public Affairs, they have no idea about any of this. They have no idea about the collapse of the peace process, the rise of an intifada. They have no idea about then Prime Minister Ariel Sharon, a man noted for his military experience withdrawing from Gaza. They have no idea of Hamas takeover of Gaza. They have no idea that another Israeli Prime Minister back when I was Secretary of State, namely Netanyahu, was willing at least to keep talking about some kind of two-state process. That's our fault, meaning the ignorance. The information they get, more often, more often than not, is off of social media, where they are picking up not only misinformation, but deliberate disinformation that they are absorbing and acting on and not knowing even what they're saying. So this is a problem that was really exposed on October 7th, but we have to recognize it as a much bigger problem even than that. It's clear from Mrs. Clinton's statement that she believes better education is the key, but with the educational system so debased, how is that going to work? I don't think that there's a magic bullet, but I do think there are strategies available and reasons for hope. Starting with hope, Florida and 11 other states have passed anti-DEI laws, diversity, equity, and inclusion laws, applicable to state schools and state government. For instance, the law in Texas bans diversity statements in hiring, and diversity training for faculty and staff, and it's also forced the University of Texas at Austin to close its multicultural engagement center. At many public universities, the DEI staff is actually larger than the faculty, but diversity deans and their staffs will be facing mass layoffs in state with these laws. And if there is new leadership in Washington, the bans against DEI might extend to the federal level, affecting all schools that accept federal grants or enroll students who take out federally backed loans. While these laws won't directly prevent intersectionality, they do send a powerful message to students, faculty, and administrators that woke policies might be more trouble than they are worth. We need to do more than count on government and elections. It's not enough for pro-Israel students to love Israel or to go to the Hillel or Chabad for Shabbat meals. They need to know how to fight back against the Israel haters, how to put the other side on the defensive, how to make them lose confidence in their positions. For example, there was a recent debate that included interaction between Ben Shapiro and a college student, and he mentioned the Oslo agreements between Israel and the Palestinians, and the student looked shocked and said there were no such agreements because such agreements contradicted her worldview. Therefore, they couldn't have happened. Enough audience members who knew better embarrassed her by laughing. The key is that knowledge is power and knowledge creates courage. Jewish students who hear anti-Israel charges are not likely to speak up if they don't have the facts and they don't know what to say. So here are a few of the sorts of facts students and pro-Israel advocates have to know and use. We often hear the charge that there are settler-only roads from which Arabs are barred. In fact, there are no settler-only or Jewish-only roads anywhere in Israel or the West Bank. 
In response to Palestinian terror attacks that have killed motorists on the roads, there are some roads that are Israeli only, but that includes Israeli Jews, Arabs, Christians, plus some Palestinians from the West Bank who have permits. And I'll show you now some of the ev evidence for this. So Route 443 is one of those roads that's supposedly Jewish only. Notice that the signs are in Arabic and Hebrew. If they're Jewish only, you wonder why the signs would be in Arabic as well. Here's a picture. It's not a great picture because I'm the one who took it. Here's a picture of an Arab, obviously Arab woman in that store. If the road is Jewish only, what is she doing there? Here's a picture on the road. You can see on the left, an Israeli security vehicle, you can see behind it a, uh, a Palestinian minibus, a Palestinian van taking Palestinians, not Israeli Arabs, into Israel. In the foreground, you can see an Israeli car. That's an Israeli license plate, but look who's in the car. So that's an Arab car. Now, the other side of the, of the, of, 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 of the uh, issue, of course, is that there are places where there are uh, uh, apartheid roads, not in Israel. The apartheid roads are in Saudi Arabia, the Muslim holy, the, the, the land of the Muslim holy places. So here's a street sign, a highway sign on the road to Mecca in Saudi Arabia. And you can see it says helpfully in English and Arabic, Muslims only. Talk about an apartheid road. They don't hide it at all. Again, here's another one. Arafat, Mecca, Muslims only. It doesn't refer to Yasser Arafat, by the way. Arafat, Mecca, Muslims only. And then Riyadh, obligatory for non-Muslims. So non-Muslims have to take the off-ramp and go to Riyadh. And in fact, it's confirmed by the Saudi government website. It says on the Saudi government tourist site that these sites have special religious significance and only persons of the Islamic faith are allowed entry. So this is exactly what Jewish students have to point out, that if you want to talk about apartheid roads, there are apartheid roads, but they're in Saudi Arabia. So Muslim students on campus have some explaining to do, but only if they are actually challenged by students who have the facts. Another problem for those who claim that Israel is apartheid is the case of Moshe Katsav, the former president of Israel. President Katsav was charged with serious crimes while he was in office against female aides. And he was convicted by a three-judge district court panel headed by an Israeli Arab judge. Parenthetically, I should say Israel doesn't have jury trials, only trials in, in, in front of judges since the mandate days. When Katsav appealed to the Supreme Court, the charges were upheld by a three-judge panel that included a different Israeli Arab judge, Supreme Court Justice Salim Jubran. So the Jewish state practices a unique and previously unknown form of apartheid where the Israeli Jewish president can be thrown in jail by Israeli Arab judges. And Katsav did not receive a slap on the wrist. He was in jail for five years. We have published long articles on the camera site debunking the apartheid charges on the leading anti-Israel websites, point by point. And we've used this debunking successfully on some of the toughest campuses. They work but Jewish students have to learn the facts and then figure out how to use them on their campus to start rolling back the anti-Israel tide, both in the quad and in the classroom. And that is exactly what we were trying to help them do as Sasha will describe in just a moment. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Safian. Um, my name is Sasha Cherniak and I'm the Content Campaigns Manager for Cameron Campus. Um, in just a second, I will share my screen and tell you a little bit about the campus situation. So these days, um, students are in fear for their safety. They are harassed, they are yelled at, and even attacked. Like at UC Berkeley, where a young student was choked during a violent response to an Israeli speaker on campus. This happened just two weeks ago. 
Or this past October, mere weeks after Hamas's invasion, a Cornell student made a series of anti-Semitic threats against the Jewish community on campus. This included a threat to shoot up the kosher dining hall and encouraging others to follow Jews home and kill them. He has since been arrested and is facing federal criminal charges. Last week, our students at Exeter University in the UK were doing something we call tabling. This is where students set up a table in the center of campus and provide information that too often gets omitted about Israel on campus environments and campus discussions. For example, a lot of the information that you just heard from Dr. Safian would be available at one of these tables. When our students at Exeter tried to provide this information, a mob, a mob of over 100 students descended upon them, calling them agents of Israel and threatening their presence on campus. Let me show you the video clip of that encounter. What's going on? Please come. And, and maybe everybody here, when you hear them shouting for an intifada, know that you can't have a ceasefire yeah. and an intifada at the same time. Thank you. You're acting as if this is intimidation, but this is how, um, it's pretty, uh, what's it called? Yeah, it means, does everyone want to pick a set back? I'm not asking you to leave, I'm just saying, like, give us some space. This organization funded by the Israeli government at the university allow to keep track of pro-Palestinian students they're on a list. Understand that the university allowed this. A list of they published. directly support Israel. Check their Wikipedia. They're not leaving. This is passive. It's all active. Check their as you saw in the video, the university staff that was present did nothing to get the crowd of students to disperse or protect the well-being of our students. What you saw is unfortunately common. Recently, at Queens College, an IDF soldier was invited to speak, and an anti-Israel mob would not have it. They screamed at him as he was being escorted by security. They called him a terrorist and said he would burn in hell. Zionism has become a dirty word and is used to ostracize students on campus and in some cases threaten their grades and ability to speak if they are proud Zionists. University clubs use Zionism as a litmus test to determine if someone is a good Jew or a bad Jew. These examples of bullying are the culture that is produced by Israeli Apartheid Week. What's going on? Students are reacting in this way in part because of an organized yearly campaign of lies from Students for Justice in Palestine who are behind the Apartheid Week campaign. Supporters of Israeli Apartheid Week, such as the BDS movement, call it a tool for mobilizing grassroots support on the global level for the Palestinian liberation struggle against Israel's decades-old regime of settler colonialism and apartheid. This is a direct quote. It attempts to link Israel's existence and its policies to the horrific racism of apartheid South Africa. Apartheid Week is fre frequently expressed with a mock apartheid wall that is erected on the campus as you can see in the photo in the right-hand corner. Throughout the week, events are held that present Israel as a racist, evil regime rather than the multicultural democracy that it is. The events include platforming and supporting terrorists like Leila Khaled, who is considered a hero and a woman of resistance. Other speakers include terrorist sympathizers, such as Mohammed El Kurd, Noor Erekat, Hassan Bazian, and as you can see also Linda Sarsour. The upshot is the academic spaces are no longer welcoming environment for Jews. And now they are normalizing the idea that Israel is a genocidal state. The accusation that Israel is an apartheid state is no longer bad enough. So what are we doing to combat this? To address the lies and distortions, Cameron Campus launched the Apartheid Week Exposed campaign. This campaign is a strategic effort to combat anti-Israel misinformation during Israeli Apartheid Week. Our efforts span both, apart, both before the Apartheid Week campaign officially begins and after that so that we can get ahead of the allegations and also refute this rhetoric throughout the academic year. Altogether, our campaign spans from the end of February through March. Initially, our campaign began as a purely social media effort, but it is transformed into several 
on the ground speaking events and various tabling materials, all of which are designed to debunk the apartheid lies. For example, regarding the chance to globalize the Intifada, we have a graphic for that, as well as many other falsehoods. This year, we decided to bring the campaign to campus in a more in-your-face sort of way. We created a tabling kit for students and include 13 printed graphics and five massive roll-up banners that cover topics such as uh, the issues that you heard Dr. Safian share. We also have printable stickers that students could use on campus to attract students away from SJP mock apartheid wall and bring them to our website where they can learn the truth. The campaign has also reached beyond the scope of camera students. Our website has become a leading resource for the entire Israel community, placing camera on campus at the forefront of this effort to tackle anti-Israel rhetoric. Our partnerships with social media influencers and pro-Israel organizations like the Israeli American Council and many others increase the ability to empower students and give them the resources they need. This year, we worked closely with legal scholars to provide accurate explanation to students for, for instance, defining what a siege is and other terminology people use but do not understand. We also organized a speaking tour with social media influence and journalist Emily Schrader, who challenged students' common misconceptions about Israel, Iran, and social media. She spoke to students at Brandeis University, UC Berkeley, UC Davis, and UCLA. Through these efforts, we're changing the campus culture. Last year, our Pi Should Be Exposed website had over a million visitors. This year, we hope to double that. This is an important resource we continue to grow every year with new material and ever expanding partnerships. I know a lot of you have questions, so I'm going to turn it over to Adam Gordon for our Q&A. Thank you so much. Great, thank you to both of our speakers, Sasha and Dr. Safian. Um, I do want to offer time for Q&A. So if you do have a question for either of our speakers, please use the Q&A function to do so. Um, I do want to start with a question for you, Sasha. Um, how does the Apartheid Week Exposed Campaign support Jewish students on campus? I think that is a really good question. Thank you so much, Adam. Um, so we do trainings for our students. We prepare them at our conferences throughout the school year and provide them the resources and skills that they need to address these issues. Um, we also speak to our students and other students and bring awareness to this campaign and so that they know that this is a resource uh, they can utilize whether they are a camera student or not. The website is easily accessible. Um, we have the QR code stickers that are on all Apartheid Week materials. Um, or Let me re rephrase that. We have the QR code on all of our printed materials as well as the stickers, giving Jewish, non-Jewish students, anyone who wants to know that the wall is full of lies, access to the material you see on the website. Awesome. Thank you so much. And Dr. Sapien, this is a question for you. Um, you provided a lot of examples of why Israel is not an apartheid state. Something that detractors like to focus on is the separation barrier. Can you give us some background on why Israel erected the, sec the separation barrier and why this does not constitute apartheid? Well, um, you know, no suicide bombings, no separation barrier, no security barrier. It's as simple as that. I remember the first time I went to Israel, which was quite a few years ago, more than I want to admit, there were no walls. There were no barriers. There were hardly any checkpoints. I remember going to Kasaria on the beach uh, near Tel Aviv and during the week, and most of the people there uh, had Palestinian license plates. They were coming to the beach during the week when a lot of Israelis were working. Um, that's what those days were like. But with uh, suicide bombing campaigns, which were, you know, so terrible and killed so many people, a thousand people for the second intifada, um, Israel had to do something to stop those suicide bombers from getting in. And so they built a security barrier and it's worked. It's worked extremely well, despite naysayers as usual who say, oh, what you're doing doesn't work, it's never worked. It isn't true. And um, the wall that Israel built is no more an apartheid wall than the similar wall that was built in Northern Ireland to uh, separate between Protestants and Catholics. I believe it was in Dublin, which also was somewhat successful in stopping uh, intercommunal attacks. Um, so 
the wall is hardly the only such wall in the world. There are many other countries who've had to build such walls to try to prevent violence. Um, it doesn't separate uh, by race because it's protecting Israeli Jews and Israeli Arabs from Palestinian terrorist attacks. Um, so it has absolutely, it, it's ridiculous to call it apartheid unless the claim is that all Palestinians are suicide bombers. If the other side is making that claim, then yes, it's keeping all Palestinians out, but it's targeted against suicide bombers. And it does allow, of course, with checkpoints, uh, uh, a lot of Palestinians uh, before October 7th to enter into Israel. Uh, I remember at one point doing a little analysis and showed that the waiting time at the checkpoints for Arabs to get in, for Palestinians to get into Israel was shorter than the waiting time at checkpoints at JFK after, of course, the 9-11 attacks, which was, uh, well, we don't go into who carried those out, but after the 9-11 attacks were carried out, we also had to improve our security and we had rather onerous checkpoints and it took longer at JFK than it did for Americans to pass through security barriers to make sure they weren't carrying knives or bombs than it did for Palestinians to get into Israel. So all in all, I think it's just more uh, anti-Israel, pro-Palestinian propaganda that has no basis in fact. Thank you. And I have a question that I think either of you could answer. Um, how do you deal with anti-Semitic slash anti-Zionist professors on campus? Well, well that is, I was going to say that is definitely easier said than done. Um, the issue with professors is very, very tricky. First and foremost, it depends on whether or not they have tenure, which means it becomes an extremely near impossible process to get them removed if that is the goal. The first step um, would be for students to speak with their dean or their own advisor and launch a complaint that way. That can get the ball rolling. Um, unfortunately, as we have seen um, based on various congressional hearings and things, that the university administrators are not uh, very capable in addressing a lot of the general issues on campus, let alone that of professors. But there are avenues for students to pursue if they are actively being discriminated against by their professors. I would say two things in addition to that. Number one, um, if the course is in your major, then it's the student's major, then it's problematic. It's, it could be difficult for the student to deal with it. So unless the course is closed, and some of these courses are being closed just for this reason, if you can get a friend to sign up for the course, maybe as a, um, as an, I forget what they call it, but as an attendee, as an observer, rather than a, an enrolled student in that course, but even as an enrolled student uh, who's not in that major, then they have greater leeway, number one, to speak up, Number two, to start recording in class, um, especially if the, the state is not a two-party state. And even if it is, there, there are arguments that it's a public lecture, so it maybe could be recorded legally. We can help with those legal matters. Um, it's important to record them. Uh, I would, but I, I mean, for me, I would, my inclination is to go talk to the professor. Not that it's going to help a great deal, but I even bring up stuff in class, debate the professor in class and say, look, uh, yesterday you said such and such according to this document. I have this document here. Could you show me where it says that? Because it doesn't seem to, it seems to not support what you said. I, I mean, that's enjoyable. That's fun to do. So again, if you're in that major, uh, it could be dangerous and, and, and difficult. But if you're not, it's actually fun. Think of it as fun, because that's what it is. Embarrass them in class. Make them put up or shut up. That's what I would suggest for a pro Israel student. And we can help with that, obviously. And on the other end of things, what about Jewish students who themselves are accosting their fellow Jews on this? The anti-Israel Jews, this kind of growing phenomenon. We have a, a, a participant who notes the BU student who was videotaped tearing down the posters of Israeli hostages. And I'll note that it was actually camera supported students at BU who, who taped that. And um, that became a viral video on the Internet. That's well, a really, sure. go ahead, Alex, go ahead. please. No, go ahead. I was going to say, it's a really, this is the challenge that our students are facing. Um, I think having conversations in private with their fellow Jews can get the ball rolling away from cameras, away from the attention seeking people, um, and have earnest conversations. Um, I think one issue sometimes stems from the fact that these guys don't actually know anything about the conflict. They hear the rhetoric that SJP and their ilk have spun. They see the token anti-Zionist Jews. They get paraded around and they think, oh, 
you know, the heartstrings get pulled and they start feeling bad and they start feeling guilty. Meanwhile, they're feeding into this misinformation. Having earnest meeting to meeting conversations with your fellow Jewish peers and being like, guys, this is not the case. Look, you don't have to agree with everything that Israel does. You don't have to like every aspect of the Israeli government. No Israeli likes every aspect of the Israeli government or anybody else for that matter, right? So the start would be to have those conversations and, and re-emphasize that Zionism at the end of the day is Jewish self-determination in our ancestral homeland, that the right of Israel to exist is not in any way inherently evil or bad. It is a right that a lot of different groups of people and a lot of nations have. They exist and they're allowed to exist. We have another question. Um, a lot of what is discussed are defense strategies. Are there any kind of offensive plans that students can use? Um, any kind of offensive talking points? How would they go about being offensive as opposed to defensive? I yeah, think, well, I, I think we, you know, if you saw the banners that Sasha displayed, one of them goes after the, the uh, as, we use, as we say, the George Washington of the Palestinian National Movement, the founder of the Palestinian National Movement, the Grand Mufti, Hajimin al-Husseini, who was a Nazi war criminal. And so the thing that we need to do is, is just escalate that and put it in everybody's face that the founder of the Palestinian National Movement is a Nazi, was a Nazi war criminal um, who, who didn't just, I mean, he spent the, all the war years in Berlin working with the Nazis, making anti, uh, making pro-Nazi broadcasts to the Arab world, recruiting uh, uh, Muslims in the Balkans to create a Muslim SS division, which was created and which carried out brutal war crimes against uh, Christians and Jews in the Balkans. Um, and for good reason, he was treated as a war criminal by the post-war Yugoslavian government. Unfortunately, he escaped. He escaped justice with some help from the British, uh, we believe, uh, because they thought he might still be useful in, in, in the Arab world uh, for them. Um, but that's the kind of thing where you have to go on the offensive instead of having Jewish students explaining, no, it's not apartheid, no this, no that, no, you're wrong, there's no Jewish-only roads. You say, well, yes, but there are Muslim-only roads in the holiest place for all Muslims, so why don't you explain that? And you'll see a lot of hemming and hawing, oh, that's whataboutism. I say, no, it's not a whataboutism, it's apartheid. And maybe you need to explain it. Maybe you need to do something about the apartheid in Saudi Arabia that says that only Muslims can visit Mecca and Medina when Jerusalem, the holiest city for Jews, is open to everybody. So put them on the defensive. Put up the picture of the Mufti. Put them on the defensive. I mean, as I said, we've done this. I've done this on, on some of the worst campuses. And it really works because they're not used to being on the defensive. They're not used to being, uh, 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 being forced to answer questions. What they are used to is pointing the finger and judging Jews. They're not used to somebody pointing the figure at them and asking them to explain. It's very uncomfortable for them because they're incapable. So that's the thing to do. Put them on their back foot. It's very enjoyable, again, to see that where they start mumbling and not know what to say. I think in addition from the campus side of things, Jewish students really have to get the ball rolling on this long before um, Apartheid Week rolls around. Um, we're talking about you know, again, we mentioned, I mentioned tabling in my presentation, um, hosting events with dynamic speakers, holding teach-ins um, is kind of where the start of that is. From there, building relationships, something that Students for Justice in Palestine has done very well, unfortunately for us, is they've really combined the Palestinian struggle with a lot of these other, with a lot of um, progressive causes, women's rights, LGBT rights, the uh, climate change, et cetera. And this has, a, so they've linked these two struggles as one, and that actually leads to a lot of anti-Semitism and ostracizing Jewish students from these spaces. Um, but starting the ball rolling early, meeting with the clubs that other students are a part of, building those relationships, having conversation, that's how you be proactive. So that when SGP does erect their wall, the kid from the climate change club or the kid from the LGBT club, or excuse me, student, will come to our student and say, Hey, Sasha. Hey, Adam. I just saw this on the wall or, you know, SGP is putting this event. Can you tell me what it's about? Helping build those relationships of trust, educating the campus community as a whole outside of just the, our fellow Jews is so, so important when being proactive. 
Yeah, what, what Sasha described is just the intersectional alliance of all these supposedly oppressed groups. And, you know, from military strategy, if you're facing an alliance, the most important thing is to try to split it apart. Try to find areas in which these allies actually don't agree. Um, I could make some suggestions. For instance, there are fairly large uh, Indian groups. I don't mean Native American, but from India, Indian groups on campus, for instance, at Harvard. Um, the Indian government is quite friendly towards Israel. And many of these Indian students are quite patriotic and are being funded by their government anyhow. So um, it would be, I think, a good idea to try to talk to those groups, as Sasha said, not during apartheid week, but well before. How about at the start of the semester and try to peel them off, try to have an alliance with them so that it's not just Jewish students tabling by themselves with all these other groups arrayed against them, it's important finally to get some groups to support, to, to stand with the Jewish groups. And I would say also the Jewish groups have to drop their um, their allergy against conservative groups on campus because there are conservative groups on campus, even at Harvard, at Yale, at Princeton. I know because we've used some of them successfully when we couldn't get the Jewish group to support at Princeton. I won't go into the details, but at Princeton, there was a speaker that the Jewish group Tigers for Israel was going to have, and they got intimidated out of doing it by the halal on the campus imam. And we successfully turned it around. The conservative club at Princeton agreed to sponsor the speaker because they didn't care what the campus halal rabbi had to say, and they really didn't care what the campus imam had to say. So they sponsored her, and it ended up being extremely successful. So having an alliance with those who are, you know, alliance of convenience, as they used to say, even with conservative groups on campus, is probably a good idea. And I think that's what Jewish students have to start doing. We have a great question here about administrators. How would you suggest motivating administrators on campuses who are claiming to have their hands tied by academic freedom and free speech to address groups like SJP's activities? Well, the... In many cases, H SJP is violating uh, the student rules of conduct and the rules of conduct for student groups. And on that basis, we've seen a number of SJP groups get suspended uh, as, as recognized student groups. I think that's a positive. In terms of free speech, I mean, the reaction at, at, at Harvard, the criticism of Claudine Gay, the president of Harvard, was exactly on target. She, she's talking about free speech, but she never talked about free speech when other speakers who didn't agree with her politics were not able to speak at Harvard. She was fine with that. But when it came time for pro speakers to speak, you hear excuses like, oh, you know, we can't allow them because of security. Well, there, there may be some violent incident triggered by this speaker. Well, it is the job of these universities to provide security to maintain free speech. You cannot have a heckler's veto, which is exactly what they are doing. There's never a problem having a radical pro-Palestinian, or sh I should say not really pro-Palestinian, because many, most of them are not pro-Palestinian, they're just anti-Israel. That's an important distinction. There's no uh, uh, prohibition against these anti-Israel speakers. There's absolutely, you know, they, they are able to speak. No one breaks up their meetings. There's never a question of security, doesn't allow us to have this speaker. Uh, it's a two-way street. It has to be a two-way street, or you're violating the First Amendment. Now, at a private university like Harvard, they're not legally required to live by the First Amendment, but they claim that they do that. Uh, and we saw that in the lawyerly answers that those three college uh, university leaders gave at the, at, at, at the famous hearing in the House. And it didn't work out too well for them because their hypocrisy was exposed. And that's, I think, exactly what you need to do is expose the hypocrisy. And I think pro-Israel students should start inviting what I would say are controversial speakers and letting the university know ahead of time they expect full security and that their event will not be disrupted. I'm talking about people, for instance, like Daniel Pipes, who was a uh, Harvard, I think he was a, a junior fellow at Harvard. He was a graduate of Harvard. His father was a famous professor at Harvard who died recently. Uh, he's got a real, you know, history at Harvard. Uh, interviewed, you know, have Daniel Pipes come to come come to campus and speak. We saw the example of an Israeli lawyer, an IDF veteran who was prevented from speaking, I guess it was that at Berkeley uh, a week or two ago. The thing to do is never allow that to stand. Invite him again and have the event. Otherwise, the, 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 the silencers win and we can't let them win. 
So invite him again is what the students at, at Berkeley should do with proper security and have him speak. I think they need to do that. They need to get in the face of the opposition. Playing defense is fine, but it's not enough. I, I think that's a really good point, Dr. Safe. And the only thing I would add to that is it's having conversations with administrators, um, as has been the case for many students, only goes so far when those administrators refuse to take action. And holding them accountable in the ways that Dr. Safian described, I think, is a good start. Um, there are other efforts to sort of bring awareness to SJP activities, as Dr. Safian again said. Um, reader, understanding university policies towards uh, freedom of speech against what, un what university clubs are allowed or not allowed to do. Um, one of the things in terms of um, elements of um, how clubs conduct themselves, they cannot, in many cases, they are not allowed to discriminate against certain kinds of students. They are not allowed, there are certain things they are not allowed to do because they are in effect representing the university. And so this is actually, I think, sometimes overlooked and bringing that attention to the administrators like, hey, these are the rule, these are the clear cut rules that SJP is violating because they did this, because they put up posters where they shouldn't put up posters, because they're advocating essentially for, in they're inciting violence against Jews. If you can bring that specific concrete evidence along with pointing to the university policies, even if the administrators don't do anything with it, you have done sort of your section of the job effectively. And then from there, then it becomes a case of like, of essentially trying to get entities outside to hold universities accountable for their inaction, if inaction is the case. We have a very important question here that I think a lot of Zionists ask themselves right now. How can we get the truth out when no one wants to listen? Yell it, scream it, put it on social media, talk about your existence in every space you can. Um, I think it, it is hard and it's scary. And I was at an event where three young women who were academics, who were actually UPenn students, um, and they gave a really lovely presentation. Um, the point of the presentation was about kind of just uh, the Jewish people. And they had an entire section on Zionism that they didn't feel comfortable keeping in because, um, you know, it's Zionism is now seen, as I mentioned earlier, a dirty word. Um, and that fear is something that I think a lot of students are struggling with, but we have to find ways to remain steadfast and remain strong and, you know, utilize the power of our community. And in the case of college campuses, between us, camp, between Camera and so many other camp, you know, Israel-oriented organizations that have partnered with us on Apartheid Week Exposed, there are so many resources and assistance available to help empower those students. But we have to keep talking about, about this. We have to keep, stay proud of who we are as Zionists. Um, because if we, we cannot continue letting someone else write our own narratives. So we have to keep speaking the truth in every space that we can. Um, and it has to be, th there are ways to have those conversations. And I think one of the challenges is finding the ways to have those conversations. I mentioned earlier, keeping those conversations in private, speaking in person, don't like is, is I think the most important step. We all want to argue with people on social media, um, until our hands hurt and we are blue in the face, but the real conversations, the real change is going to happen when you step outside of social media, where you show people how algorithms are being manipulated. Um, to present more anti-Israel content that is full of lies and misinformation rather than accurate information. This question deals with the legal end of things. Recently, there have been a lot of lawsuits filed against institutions like Harvard and Columbia for failing to protect the rights and safety of Jewish students on campus. Are there national legal offices set up to file or facilitate the filing of such legal actions against universities and other institutions that behave similarly? I'm happy to answer this. So there are um, legal-based organizations like the Lawfare Project and the Brandeis Center who um, work with students um, to to address issues of discrimination and bring those lawsuits. Um, those lawsuits, and Dr. Safian, please correct me if I say something that is inaccurate, um, are then sent, the claims are then filed um, with the Department of Education um, against these universities, um, whose job it is then to um, investigate those incidents. Thank you.
And it has been alleged that disproportionate criticism of the state of Israel is anti-Semitism. Yet some of the most prominent critics of Israel are Jews. In academia, you have people like Noam Chomsky and Norman Finkelstein. In politics, there's Bernie Sanders. Is it possible for Jews to be anti-Semites? I'm sure. I mean, you know, the people that I mentioned earlier in the Soviet Union, all those Jewish names who were involved in the anti-Zionist and really the anti-Semitic efforts of the Soviet Union, uh, one of their goals was to portray Jews who wanted to emigrate as, as anti-Soviets and, and, and as dangerous people who needed to be imprisoned. So yes, of course, uh, Jews can be anti-Semites. Uh, Bernie Sanders, I think, is a perfect example of that. As far as prominent academics, I mean, Noam Chomsky, thank God, is exceedingly old and is failing. Uh, if you've seen him recently, he's a shadow of what he used to be. Norman Finkelstein was drummed out of academia, I think, appropriately, based on the very low quality of his work and his uncollegiality, namely, you know, making a pain, being a pain in the neck with all his colleagues at the few places he did have jobs. So yeah, but there is a problem of Jewish, uh, um, you know, uh, anti-Semites or anti-Zionists. Well, we'll deal with that. That's true. There are also Jewish professors and other professors who are standing up for Israel. You know, we've seen that at Columbia. We've seen that at other universities. We've seen that at Harvard Law School, for instance. There are we have a very active group among Harvard Law School students, and there are professors at Harvard, not just Alan Dershowitz, who's retired, but other professors on faculty who are very pro-Israel and who are standing up for that. So it's not all bleak. Um, and I would say, you know, the Jewish anti-Semites or anti-Zionists are a problem, but the Muslim anti-Zionists, like the ones I mentioned at Brown and 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 at, um, at, at Columbia, which is where I got my bachelor's, though long before any of this stuff was happening, um, th those guys are terrible. They're not even academics. I mean, they're, 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 their work is nonsense. And that's one of the unfortunate things that, you don't actually have to, it's not academic anymore. It's not scholarship. It's just repeating nonsensical tropes. And these are their papers quoting each other. Um, that has to be fought against. And it's not impossible. It, 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 it can be done. But the most important thing, of course, is, is not to stand there and think, oh my God, it's so impossible. Where am I going to start? The most important thing is starting, right? As the Chinese proverb goes, the longest journey begins with a single step. So the most important thing, if you don't know what to do, just do something and see what happens and learn from your experience, but do something. That's very important. The next question deals with the IHRA working definition of anti-Semitism. Do you think trying to get campuses to adopt the IHRA definition is a good use of our resources, time, and energy? I think it's a great start. And actually to the previous question, the IHRA definition, working definition of anti-Semitism clarifies um, the difference between legitimate criticism of Israel and anti-Semitism, whereas the general guideline is if you criticize Israel like that of any other nation, um, it's not anti-Semitism. It's when you are disproportionately targeting the is Israel as a country um, in a way you would not target any other state where it is no longer legitimate criticism. Um, the I think part of the issue that I see um, on campus is sometimes people don't actually understand what anti-Semitism is. They think it's just like, oh, if, you know, you draw a Jew in a stereotypical, you know, the the, the way the Nazis did, that's anti-Semitism. Yes, but anti-Semitism doesn't just manifest in that way. Um, so the IHRA definition, I think, is a really important guideline to start having those conversations about anti-Semitism. Um, so that you know, whether we're talking about university administrators or even the student body can come to understand the various forms that anti-Semitism comes in. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that universities will be will do anything um, to enforce that. That's sort of a separate issue. But bringing that guideline to the forefront can be very helpful. And if it's also adopted outside of university scapes, can help lead to universities sort of following guidelines of their state, for example. Next question deals with some of the buzzwords that we frequently see. How do you answer the idea that Israel is a white European settler colonialist state? <laughs> well, number one, the majority of plurality, certainly of Israelis, maybe now a majority even, uh, are not of you know, European heritage. They're uh, people who were expelled or left or whose relatives left 
uh, Arab Muslim countries, so-called Mizrahi Jews, Jews from the Arab world. Uh, that is the largest group of people in Israel. Plus, of course, you also have the Ethiopian uh, Aliyah to Israel. So we see, if you look at the, unfortunately, the soldiers who are being killed in, in fighting in Gaza against the terrorists of Hamas, Every now and then you see somebody who looks exactly like uh, an American black soldier, but it's an Ethiopian Jewish soldier fighting proudly in the IDF. So that picture of Israel as some sort of European implant is absolute nonsense. We know from the beginnings of Israel that, in fact, the British mandate, because of the great improvements it made um, uh, while it was in effect, actually drew not just Jews to the land of the Palestine mandate, but also drew many Arabs from surrounding countries to the land, to the Palestine mandate, because the, the British brought in public hygiene, which was much better than anywhere else in the Arab world, much better than neighboring countries. The British brought in honest court systems uh, where people could get a fair shake, even if they weren't from a prominent clan. Um, nobody could steal your business because the person trying to steal your business was some famous wealthy person in the British-run courts during the Palestine Mandate, that didn't happen. Um, all this was a great boon to the economy and to the population. In fact, there's a Edward Said told the story, unintentionally illustrating this. His family was from Egypt. In fact, his father had the first general stationery store in, in, in Egypt, selling stationery. Uh, which, by the way, was taken away by the uh, by the Muslim government because they were Christians, of course. That's something he doesn't talk about. But they had a, a, a baby daughter who died right after childbirth in Egypt, and they felt it was because of poor hygiene in the Egyptian hospital. So the next time they got the mother got pregnant, they went to relatives in Jerusalem to go to the hospital in Jerusalem, which had much better standard of care. So Edward Said is illustrating himself how the improvements that the British brought to Palestine to the Palestine mandate helped to draw Arabs and Jews to Israel. So the idea that Israel is some sort of settler state, well, there's lots of Arab settlers who came to Israel. Let's put it that way. As far as being colonial, no. I mean, what the Jews did was the opposite. The Jews are one of the first to throw out the colonialists. The Jews fought and threw out the British. Right, They ended the Palestine mandate. The British threw up their hands because of the Jewish resistance. The Jewish, the, the, the Jewish drive for independence was an anti-colonial movement, one of the first successful ones. And for that, they should get credit from these people who say they're anti-colonial. Israel is a success story in getting rid of a colonial power. Uh, it is the national liberation movement of the Jewish people. Zionism is the national liberation movement of the, of the Jewish people. And it succeeded in ending British colonialism in the Palestine mandate. <clears throat> so it's the furthest thing from a colonial settler state. Well, thank you. And thank you all for these amazing questions. That's all the There's time. One more, that's actually one more question I noticed that I, that I would like to answer because it's very important. Somebody asked about this spreading to high schools. Um, there's a very, very uh, inspiring story that I'd like to tell you very briefly about what happened in a town north of Boston that we heard about. Um, this is a 15-year-old kid in high school, uh, Jewish with Israeli parents, um, who'd gone to a Jewish day school, but he didn't learn what I'm about to tell you in a Jewish day school. His school, his class was talking about Palestine and the Palestinians, and he got very upset because what was being said was totally inaccurate. And he knew from his mother, as it turns out, he knew the accurate story of the name and the word Palestine, where it came from and what it meant historically. He actually knew this. Um, there's wonderful articles by Bernard Lewis and in his books about the origins of the name, where it comes from, how come Palestine was never mentioned in the Christian Bible. They say Jesus is a Palestinian, except in the Christian Bible, no mention of Palestine. So interesting uh, problem for them. He knew all the history. And so he wrote a handwritten note, which later got sent to us, to his to his uh, teachers, protesting what they were teaching as being inaccurate and false, and that the Romans named the Jewish land as Palestine after the ancient enemy of the Jews, the Philistines, after the Jews um, uh, revolted against the Romans, 
they defeated the Jewish revolt, unfortunately, and they drove the Jews out and they destroyed Jerusalem. They destroyed the temple and they renamed the entire area Palestine after, as I said, after the Philistines, the ancient and long disappeared enemy of the Jews. That's where the name Palestine came from. It was not Arab at all. It was the Romans who did that to the Jews. He knew this. He laid it out to his teachers. He proved it. And the most interesting thing is that afterwards now the teachers are running these uh, uh, these these workshops and I should they, these worksheets and these uh, uh, history past this 15 year old student to make sure it's correct before they present it to the classroom. This is what knowing something, having the facts and being willing to speak up is able to accomplish. It's not hopeless at all. This 15 year old Jewish student, thanks to being educated by his mother, was able to do this successfully in his high school. Now, not to say that it would work in every high school or every classroom, but it worked here and it ought to be tried in many other places. Knowledge is power and this young man proved it. Well, thank you, Dr. Safian. And that's all the time that we have for today. Thank you to our panelists and those of you who joined us. I'd also like to thank our friends at the Israeli American Council. Your support means the world to us and makes our work possible. We're busy on many fronts. We're working in the Hebrew and Arab media, the Spanish media, the British media, of course, in North American media, but also on college and high school campuses. We graciously ask you to make a tax deductible contribution to ensure that Israel's foes are held accountable from the media to college campuses and to share cameras critical work amongst your network. You can make a contribution and find more from our dedicated team at www.camera.org. That concludes today's program. Thank you for being with us. Mm -hmm.